right. Uh, I always say the first question is the hardest. I want me you to tell me your name and what your position was in the uh, 23rd headquarters. Start. Well, my name is Major General George A. Ribb, retired. Um, I was a <coughs> commanding officer of the, uh, I better clear my throat. Go ahead, that's fine. <coughs> you can always start again, it's not a problem. Okay, we'll try again. Go for it. My name is George A. Reb. I was retired a major general in the Corps of Engineers. Uh, during the uh, deception unit uh, activities in Europe, I was uh, commanding officer of the 406 Engineer Combat Company Special. So tell me, you're, 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 the 406 was inside the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops. What broadly was the mission of the 23rd and how did you carry it out? Uh, broadly, there were two main ones. One was to provide security for the unit, the perimeter security in case the enemy actually did attack us. And secondly, was to uh, do any demolition work for construction or we also had extra bulldozers, which would uh, create track marks on the train over which then the dummy tanks would be put plus the camouflage. To make it look uh, more realistic. That is correct. Um, so your, um, your, your unit was involved, and your, your unit was also involved, the 406 was also involved in some of the um, Special effects, was it not? Yes. Can you tell me about that? Probably the main one was uh, my first platoon under the command of Lieutenant Daly uh, was the MP platoon for divisions. And those people would uh, have a checkpoint at the uh, commanding general's uh, place. And then also we'd put uh, men out on the major uh, crossroads and then also we had roaming patrols to keep uh, civilians, anybody else other than military person through the area. And it did, we did this also during the night after curfew to make sure that the uh, indigenous people didn't come into the operations. One other thing was uh, we had flash uh, tubes to simulate artillery fire and most of the time, our people uh, manage those. So tell me about the flash canisters. Tell me about those. How did they work? Well, it was, I believe it was a shell of a 105 artillery piece, which would put in a certain amount of uh, powder and then would ignite it to give it the flash. Now, usually the artillery piece, the dummies were set forward of the real uh, artillery and they were coordinated so that the sound and the flash uh, would appear to the enemy at the same time. So they, they, they wouldn't uh, feel there's a, really a deception going on, but that this was a real thing. So like somebody would be on the radio with the guy from the, the real artillery unit so they could happen simultaneously. Correct. Um, I'm sorry, my, my thing here goes. Um, that's a, I can't make it stop that sound, so let me know if that, that click sound happens during the interview. I'll try not to. Um, so um, so um, you were a West Point graduate? Correct. Class of? January 43. So you're a uh, January 43 West Point graduate. How did you and your engineering company that you were commanding end up in this deception unit? That's a question I like to have answered. Because you look back, when we were out at Yuma, there were about uh, six battalions of engineers out there. And uh, for us to get picked out of that one was a surprise to me. And also, when you consider all the engineer companies in the Army at that time, uh, when Jonathan Gahn was writing his book, Ghosts of the ETO, I asked him when he did his research if he ever found out the reason I certainly appreciate knowing. Did you, do you remember uh, how you got that news? 
Yes, we're out in uh, Yuma, Arizona, uh, doing maneuver work. We weren't on maneuvers at the time, and the battalion commander uh, received a message that uh, Company A, the 293rd, which we were at that time, uh, was, had been selected for a secret mission and that they would be detached from the battalion. And I don't know whether it was th that message, but subsequently informed that we were going to Camp Forest, Tennessee. And what did you, um, when you found out what this secret mission was, it's a kind of a strange mission. Uh, what did, what, what did you, I know you were a, you're an army officer, you're gonna do your duty and do what they tell you to do. But what did you think about it? Well, we thought it was going to be some kind of a special engineer uh, mission involving demolitions, uh, maybe going in early on an attack with the infantry and that sort of thing. So it was that kind of activity that we sort of thought we were going to do. And what did you, what, when you realized what you were going to do, were you disappointed or were you surprised at the, at the, that this unit was happening or did you just take it in stride? Well, I was disappointed. <laughs> Being a regular Army officer, you go to the sound of where the guns are firing. And so I had expected, as I, we were in the 293rd Combat Battalion, mine was a company, that we'd be supporting uh, the infantry or, and armored units. So it was a disappointment. But let me add, while it was a disappointment, it pr proved to be very beneficial in my army career later on because the knowledge I gained of battalion, regimental, division, corps, army uh, organizations and what they did helped me later on. Okay. Do you need some water? Are you, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. Right. Hanging now. in there. So um, one of the things that you guys did is part of the special effects as I understand it, is you would impersonate, if you will, officers in the units that you're pretending to be, uh, that you sometimes might be uh, wearing the insignia, say, of higher ranking officers. Did, is that what happened, and can you tell me about that? Yes, well, the most notable example was in the uh, Operation Vierson, uh, where the 23rd simulated two divisions, the 30th and the 79th, for the crossing of the Rhine. Now, these two divisions were in the 13th Corps, which was the middle of the 9th Army Corps, uh, zone. And they were to simulate the 30th and the 79th crossing on the 1st of April. Now, the real 79th and 30th had moved up into the 16th Corps, which was to the north near Vesel, to make the main attack. Now, <laughs> I was designated as a regimental commander of the 199th Regiment in the 30th Division. So we set up our CP, and I wore the colonels uh, in the safety of the Eagles. And I think three or four times, uh, well, m many people came in to visit in the CP, but three or four times they were West Point graduates who were senior to me. They had graduated before me, but they knew me because I was a regular on the regular basketball team, the first five for uh, three years and capped in the last year. So they'd come in and we'd talk. And then on the way out, they'd ask the, my first sergeant, who was a sergeant major, what happened to Reb? And the uh, answer was, well, you know how it is in war. If you're at the right place at the right time and you do a good job, you get promoted. So that was the story. And they'd go away, of course, quite mystified. That was one case where my rank was higher than a captain's. So you would have been. Sorry, Rick, I would just share a little bit of just a little piece of you and, and nod. I'm sorry. I should stop nodding. Um, I'm just going to ask you a couple of things about that story to get a couple of pieces of it. So, uh, tell me again, what what rank officer you would have been in, impersonating at that point? I was a really a captain, but I was impersonating a colonel a full colonel, as a com regimental commander. And the, the, for somebody who's just hearing this for the first time and trying to understand, what were the other West Point, the, the people who you, were, you had known or had known of you from West Point, what is it that they were surprised at? Well, that 
I had graduated in January uh, 43, and here we are in uh, 44, well, 45. You know, it was a short period of time to go from captain or from cadet to uh, full colonel because they were either majors or lieutenant colonels. I'm going to just ask you about that again just because you, you just to kind of try to get it right for the, for the camera. So, to, so tell me again, what I'm looking for is for you to say that, you know, they, they, were, they were surprised that you'd gone from being a West Point cadet to a colonel in, in two years and couldn't figure it out. I mean, that's essentially what I'm, what I'm looking for. Can you tell me about that again? Well, what surprised them was the last time they'd seen me, I was a cadet and graduated in January 43. And here we are and, uh, about two years later, and here I've gone from a cadet to a full colonel, which is quite unusual for such a short period of time. But again, in war, anything can happen. Now, why, why couldn't you tell them the truth? <laughs> why couldn't we tell the truth? Well, that was part of the deception. was Because not only do we have to deceive the enemy, but we also had to deceive our own people so that they wouldn't spread the word and possibly through that the enemy would find out there is such a thing as a deception unit. Uh-huh. Well, see, that's because that's something you'd be surprised. That's something that people are often very confused about is why you needed to uh, not, you couldn't tell other other uh, units or other people that you were next to or whatever uh, uh, what, what you were doing, right? You well, let me give you another example, not exactly in terms of the rank business, but in the Battle of the Breast, Battle of the Breast, um, I and my Jeep driver uh, drove into the 29th Division area. And I'm one, one of the alert was always wanting to go up forward, and especially this time to listen to the sonic unit uh, portray tanks going down the road. Well, I went off there and left him with the Jeep, and he got talked with some of the 29th people there, and he was asking questions. So some of them thought that he must be an agent or something. So they took him to the S2 section of the regiment, and he didn't say anything about what he really was, and then they took him to the division S2. Finally, the people up there contacted some of the 30, uh, 23rd headquarters people, which Sal laughed. Um, another time was during the um, Operation Casanova, uh, one of my MPs was approached by General Twaddle, who was the commanding general of the 95th, because we're uh, portray, using some of his people to portray the, the 90th Division. And so he stopped us at the MP post on the road and started asking him questions and so forth. And uh, the fellow just stuck right to it, despite the questions that Twaddle was trying to get him to say, which were not true. And so the general went back and somehow Colonel Simonson talked with Colonel Simonson and was praising uh, the soldier for not having revealed the uh, identity of what he was really doing. And so Simonson came down and applauded and commended the soldier. Did it ever strike you uh, as you're involved in this? Uh, that, 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 I mean, there are certainly aspects of this looking back now, 60 odd years later, that seem almost kind of silly. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a very serious job, but it definitely has some very humorous aspects to it, doesn't it? Well, I sort of indicate to him, but I really don't think so, except, you know, the ones I've already indicated, and there may have been others like it, but to us it was really a serious job because deception to be successful, people have to be disciplined, they have the attention to detail, and stick with the story. And that was one of the things that, uh, part of the special effects, let me just say one thing. When we trained in the United States, because as you know, we started with no SOPs, no past experience, so forth, and we sort of learned by trial and error. But nobody really thought seriously about special effects. It was only when we got into the continent and we, seeing what the situation, uh, understood the significance of it. For example, when we went in to uh, pre simulate a division, uh, our people uh, found out who learned who the commanders were, what battles they'd been in previously, really knew the history of that division in considerable detail. Uh, because they'd go into town 
and they'd probably meet soldiers that were associated with the reward asking questions so they could, you know, answer those kinds of questions. So it, it, was, it was a very good experience, and uh, the soldiers played their part. Though this was sort of a role model, or a play model. Start so, that thought again. Can you start that, that, that sentence, that thought, again? Yeah, what we were really doing was playing roles like in a play or something. People knew what the lines were, and they repeated them according to the situation. Um, I think one of the things that, and this is not on the list of questions I told you I'd ask you about, but I'll just throw oh, it out there. Oh, no, I'm expecting okay. anything. <laughs> Who knows? Curveballs <laughs> and everything else. Um, I think that, that one of the things that people who are not familiar with the military at all try to get their hands around is why deception is important. Why does the army even want to get involved in doing this, putting people doing deceptions as opposed to having them being part of a fighting force? Well, in a matter of deception, in fact, the 23rd Headquarters is the first unit in the history of warfare that was dedicated solely to deception. Now you take Napoleon and uh, Lee and Caesar, they had performed deception operation, but what they did they would take part of their fighting force and use them for deception, but when they got through, they would come back as fighting force. In contrast, our sole mission was deception. So we moved from one deception unit to operation to another. In fact, in some cases, we carried on two or three deception operations at the same time. Now, the importance of deception is, you go back to Sun Tzu, the uh, Chinese uh, philosopher, who indicate that what you're trying to do is to make the enemy think you are where you aren't or that you're larger than you are and this sort of thing, because this affects the uh, thinking and the uh, actions of the enemy, because you're trying to portray that this is a strong spot when it's really a weak spot, but you're using your strength over here for a main attack. Well, it's like in uh, football, you know, we have deception and uh, do it. Okay. It's, no, it's a good answer. Just let me say one thing. I think that's the value of the uh, 23rd Headquarters Special Troops is that it got involved in deception and did a good job. And as uh, uh, Jonathan Don in his book, uh, Ghosts of the ETO, he says something about we got to start thinking about using in the future. Well, what I have said is that we really got to get serious about it in the sense that uh, the enemy now knows what we did during World War II, his intelligence people, schools, and so forth. <clears throat> and what we should do is to have a special unit that exists to continuously think about deception, incorporating the latest military thinking technology from the smallest level to the highest level. I'm not saying to duplicate the 293rd's activities, but beyond that, as to other ways that we can do deception, and that it should be involved in the research and development of equipment, in the uh, doctrine, rewriting the doctrine for deception, but most importantly is teaching in schools so that it becomes part of the process of our thinking. Now, Colonel Simonson, who was the S3, really believed in this. Because after he retired, I used to get letters, I mean sheets of, of uh, letters on his thinking. In fact, he wrote one uh, deception, 101. And he was trying to promulgate this idea throughout the army. In fact, when I wrote my review for uh, Gon's book, uh, I gave it a copy to the chief of engineers, which incorporated these things, and he said that he gave it to the commander of uh, TRADOC, but whether he did or didn't, I don't know, but I've never since then had any access to uh, current uh, army thinking on deception, but it is a formidable uh, force if it's used properly. Now, that was one of the troubles during uh, our operations in Europe, 
Some of the commanders didn't understand it. Some of it uh, would only use it half-heartedly. Some of them wouldn't use it at all, and some of it misused it. So that's where we get into the thinking that this has to be started in the teaching and the training and so forth. So it really becomes effective, because it is effective, as our Operations Europe uh, demonstrated. The clock is ringing, so why don't we pause for a moment. Why don't you have a drink of water and uh, and charge up for a moment? Pardon? You can charge up for a moment, I said. You sound great. I know he said duplicate 293rd. I know that was either 23rd, but it's not. I can, I can edit around that. I, I, what I'm doing is I'm sort of grabbing some extra questions. <coughs> okay. Uh, one, one of the things that uh, when talking about impersonating a cop, how old was I? Because you know, that would have been, you know, if you were, you were wearing Colonel's Eagles in the deception, right. you would have been about 25, 24, 25 years old. 24, 25. Young, very young Colonel. Oh, but war. <laughs> but war. Yeah, it's a war. Are we, were we, can we be back on? You guys good? Or is it? Let's just go back up. Okay. As soon as we roll, we come back on. That's good. All, All right. right. Um, well, I will give you a, a shot here too when we're when we're done. So um, you were talking about the importance of deception. Do you have any sense? Did you have any sense at the time of whether there were particular operations you did that were successful? Did you have any indications, any feedback that led you to think, oh, this this worked or this didn't? Well, as I say, we had some which were aborted, some were misused, and there were several that I remember, I can't have the details right now, where they were considered successful. In fact, overall, the evaluation even was that <coughs> it was successful many times. Um, the one that is, stands out is the crossing of the Rhine. Uh, now, the history on the 23rd was that General Devers, who was the uh, commanding general of the American forces, and he was stationed in London before Ike took over, uh, had heard about Al Alamo and the deception. And it's my understanding he sent a team down there to study it. Uh, they came back and wrote up a report. Now, Billy Harris, Colonel Harris, was ahead of that because uh, Devers had established uh, this deception branch of which Colonel Harris headed it. And it recommended an infantry division and a, an armored division, as I recall. And uh, General Devers was about to send that to the Army, uh, the Army staff in Washington, the War Department, to uh, implement it. But General Bradley came aboard, and he suggested we add another infantry division so that it would be a core size unit. So that went back to the War Department. They approved it, and the units were. So you were, the, uh, it was big enough to imitate uh, an entire corps, you're saying. Can you exp explain that to me? Well, I, mean, people, I don't think people always know what a corps is. Well, a corps is usually three divisions, uh, along with this extra units. Now, in the crossing of the Rhine, we simulated two divisions, the 30th and the 79th. Although when the dress of the Corps was part of a Corps, uh, the 13th Corps, and they simulated the 30th and 79th. And we moved into position, set up everything, while the real divisions moved north in the 16th Corps, near Vesa, and they made the main attack. And we carried on all the activities, the sights and sounds of those divisions. In addition to this, to make them look more realistic, we had real units, which we had a, on previous operations. We had a tank battalion, infantry uh, battalion, anti-aircraft, uh, artillery, that sort of thing. And we usually put them on the perimeter of our operations so that anybody passing through, if they were accidentally in the unit, they would see the real ones, the dummies would be on the interior. 
That makes sense. Now you're talking about the, the Rhine crossing, that's Operation Beerson. Um, do you have any particular memories of that? And I, um, a lot of people have suggested that that was a, a successful operation. I know that there was a, a letter of commendation from General Simpson. Do you have any memories? What memories do you have of Operation Beerson? Well, being interested in the engineer aspect of it, uh, there was a lake in the rear part of the uh, 13th Corps area where at night we would practice assaults you know, through sound with the sonic people and also bridge making sounds that we would have. Um, so yeah, I'm going to ask you about that again because I, I try to explain this to people and they have a hard time understanding it. So I'm going to ask you about it again. Um, um, what exactly is going on? What what there's there's something. What what are you doing there, and how does that fit into the deception? Well, the thing was, we were crossing the Rhine River, which is a formidable river. It's a large obstacle, and normally in a uh, operation, you have to establish a bridgehead on the other side first. And to do that, you'd use assault boats to transport your people across because they're not going to walk on water, not yet. Um, so we had this lake back there, and we would use a sonic unit to simulate the sound of assault boats crossing uh, the river so that people would understand that, you know, we're getting really going to cross because we're practicing getting ourselves ready for it. So you're essentially, I guess and this is what I'm asking, you're, you're pretending to be rehearsing. That is correct. Can you, can you say that or say something like that? Yeah, the, the whole reason for this was to convey the impression to people that we were rehearsing or really serious about a, a river crossing. And we would be using the assault boats for the crossing. Okay. Um, I'm just going down the, the questions here. Um, was there, and we're going to talk about some of the specific uh, memories of specific operations, the few that we discussed uh, earlier. But were there occasions uh, where you personally were uh, uh, in harm's way or in contact with the enemy, um, uh, in essence, of uh, combat type situations that you were involved in uh, while you were in the, the unit? Yes, in the operation uh, Code Blance, which took place um, in mid-December 44, we were assimilating the 75th Division. And uh, this would involve a crossing because we were going to attack up through uh, the Koblenz sort of corridor, Trier to Koblenz. And so Lieutenant Colonel Fitz, who was the commander of the 603rd, and I went out to make a reconnaissance of where we might uh, cross the river. So we had two jeeps, four men in each, and we parked our jeeps behind a building and started walking down toward the river. Well, we, we had an open space around the building, and then we entered the tree line. It was shortly after we entered the tree line, bullets started falling over our heads. You could hear them, you know, hitting the leaves and the tree. So we hit the ground, and uh, some of us uh, returned fire. And for about 15 minutes, this occurred. But I got the word out that we don't want to go any further. We don't want to get captured because of the information that we had about deception, and so gradually withdrew, and Sergeant uh, Duckworth, who was a really an expert shot, I had in the rear, so he sort of covered us as we crawled back. He says he saw three Germans, and he shot, and he thinks he hit one of them. So that was the main uh, instance. The only other one was in, uh, it was an operation just before Verson, uh where I was on a road, road and on a hill, and you could go down the hill, and there was a culvert. There was a small stream going through. And the Germans were periodically putting shells in mortars on that bridge. And so it was a matter of waiting till one came in, they get up, and then just get through there. Now, this is uh, the same time, I think the day before, that Captain Wells was the headquarters was killed by an artillery barrage, evidently. So knowing that, well, I was especially 
cautious and sure what we're going to do as we go down that road. But I think that's about the only two times that there, there are other times. Well, one of them, which I had nothing to do with deception, was I wanted to know what's going on. So whenever we weren't pulling an operation, this was happening in Normandy, I went along the front lines and there was a battalion of tanks there. And so I got talked to with the, the uh, lieutenant colonel, tank commander, and while we were talking, the Germans started putting TOTs, time on target, artillery draft. So boy, we just scooted underneath the tank to protect ourselves on it. Other times, again, because I was uh, anxious to understand about war and what we did, I can remember, especially in Normandy, driving down the road, you see a couple of soldiers, you go beyond them, it's just quiet and everything. So I just tell the Jeep driver, we're getting too far away, we better get on back. But it was that sort of eerie feeling of knowing that you're in no, discovering that you're in no man's land. Yeah, discovering you're where you, maybe you don't want to be. Right. Um, all right, are you you're doing good? You're in good shape? Yep. Okay. As long as it sounds all right to you. It, and, uh, Sounds, it's in English, so I like that. And uh, uh, um, you know, one of the things. This is a, a pretty general question, but I'm just going to put it out there to you anyway. And I don't know if you have an answer to it. I mean, I've looked at John Gaughan's book. I've talked a lot to John Gaughan. I've interviewed 20 veterans of the unit. Most of them enlisted men. A few officers. Are there? Is there? Are there things that went on? That, that didn't make it into the history books, and I'm not talking about the, the, um, you know, what people did in the off duty or personal stuff or stuff like that. But in terms of the of the operations of the unit, in terms of things that you were guys were working on, um, you know, for the army, are there things that kind of didn't make it into the history books because they were still classified or people didn't want to talk about them? To be honest, I really don't know of any instances. I've thought about that question. But uh, nothing comes to mind. Okay. Um, I'm going to, uh, uh, as I said, I, we, we're going to talk a little bit about a few of the operations. And I wanted to ask you, you did talk about Operation Brest a little bit. What was going on in Operation Brest? Well, uh, the 6th Armored Division had knifed through and gotten out to Brest. And then... Uh, I believe it was the 80th, the 29th, and the 2nd Armored that were the follow-up in there. And the 6th Armored withdrew. But yet, uh, it was wanted that the 6th Armored would be portrayed as still being there. And so one of the operations there was to take a, a company of tanks and to pretend that they were a battalion of tanks of the uh, 6th Armored. In fact, reports on the German side said they always thought that the 6th Armored was in there. So we set them up as a, a unit. But, and it was a favorable uh, pathway through the German lines, but uh, before that came off, the uh, division commander decided he wanted to make his actual attack through there. And so we stopped our operations so we wouldn't attract more anti-tank guns in the area. And they, uh, the division uh, attacked through that area. The other thing I, I enjoyed in that area was that during the day, you'd see the B-17s coming over, dropping their bombs, and you could watch them leave the plane and, hit the ground and see the smoke and that. And then at night, the RAF would come by, put on their searchlights and that sort of thing and drop their bombs. So it was really a fine aerial display. Wow, that, that must have been something to see. It was. Um, so um, uh, one of the operations that I'm uh, uh, fascinated by is, the, um, is Operation Bettenborg in September of uh, 44, right after you were in, uh, in saint germain en laye and then you went out across France. It's the one that's, uh, uh, I guess Patton was, a, was trying to attack Metz and there was a sort of a, 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 sort of a hole in the line north of there that you guys were, were plugging. Does this, this, ring, this doesn't look like it's ringing a bell, so I'm... 
The only one that uh, I remember is Casanova. Okay, that's later, I think. Right, that was in uh, November, as I recall. But that was near Ukange, where uh, they took uh, part of the 95th, I think it was a battalion, we were gonna build them up to a regiment for a simulate, well, for a, a crossing to take place. They said, oh, we're going to, whereas the 90th then would be in the north of us and they'd make the real uh, crossing. Now the ninth, this uh, batta battalion, I think it was, of the 95th, wore the 90th patches and everything like that to make the enemy think that this was where the 90th was going to attack, but it didn't attack because the real one took place later on. Um, we, we had brought uh, engineer equipment for building a bridge and uh, the sonic people been down there making noise and so forth. And this was to take place, uh, I think, on the 8th of December, 8th of November of that year. And the, yeah, that day. And that morning, we got word to cancel because the division, the 95th now, was going to make its real attack through this area. So we uh, pulled out. Uh, the infantry was able to establish a bridgehead overhead, but they, when they started building the treadway bridge to, for the crossing, this is on the uh, Moose River, as I recall, or Moselle. Moselle, one of, I think. Moselle, yeah. right. Um, the artillery came down on the site, so they were not able to, to build the bridge that day. Uh, the infantry went in and established a larger bridgehead, then they were able to put it on. Did you often find, or sometimes find yourself, I mean, you're, you're out there impersonating units, you're trying to attract attention. Did you find yourself being shelled uh, by the enemy? Was that frequent, infrequent, only once in a great while? I never had that experience. Because one of the problems was, my company, which was good, uh, was split up in the three platoons and they would be attached to uh, Simonson who was running the operation, this sort of thing. In fact, at the beginning, that did not happen. I complained about it because I couldn't control all three of them spread all over the landscape. So they then started attaching my platoons to whoever the task force commander was on that. So in many instances, I did not have personal knowledge of what was going on. In other words, I wasn't into the area. And you also talked briefly about uh, Operation Coke Lens, and of course that happens essentially, the first part of that wraps up a, a day before the, the, the German attack uh, uh, in the Battle of the Bow. Do you have any uh, recollections of that experience and what you were involved with at that point, uh, how you found out what was going on, et cetera, and then, and then the, the retiring that the unit did? Well, at that time, because I'd run that ridge many times the 28th was spread out very thinly so what was desired was that to bring the 75th uh, infantry division into play now they had left england and they were still just starting out in france now i remember sending trucks back simulating the 75th coming through and the signal people say we've passed through such and such town and that sort of thing well, this is the 75th, and this is when Colonel Fritz and I were making that uh, reconnaissance for uh, the crossing. Um, so I remember that. The other thing that happened when we returned after the operation was called off, uh, returning back to Luxembourg, in the nighttime movement, all we had were the little lights on, and my <laughs> Jeep driver, we, we hit a hairpin turn. So, he started to turn on here, didn't turn quick enough, so we went over this embankment and rolled down. Fortunately, he and I were not uh, uh, hurt. The dam Jeep was pretty well damaged. I went to the uh, hospital in Luxembourg. I had 32 stitches in my left ear put in. But I say we were very, very fortunate that Jeep didn't roll on us, because it was rolling down the hill, I can remember that. I suppose it, it's, it's 
it, it, and it hadn't occurred to me before when you were telling the story, but when you, when you had the experience of being under fire in the, in the woods and that, those are probably from the troops that the, that the Germans were assembling for the attack. Might well have been. Yeah, they could have been over there re reconnoitring the air to see who was there and so forth. Your timing was lucky that you, you, know, you weren't there the next day or the day <laughs> after that. Correct. Um, is it, I mean, I, can you explain, again, for somebody who doesn't understand how, how, how kind of close a call that would have been with, uh, with Operation Koblenz coming right up to, I mean, you didn't know the Germans were going to attack, right? That is correct. What's your question, please? That's a good question. I'm trying to figure out what, how to ask the best question I can. Uh, 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 I guess I would say, explain to me, um, I know that Operation Koblenz is you're imitating the 75th uh, Armored Division. Infantry, infantry Division. Infantry Division on, on the line there. Um, did it, that came right before the Battle of the Bulge. Tell me how close that was to the Battle of the Bulge. It, it didn't have, and did it have any impact on it, I guess would be the question I'd ask. <laughs> Right, except maybe uh, Germans made sure to reinforce their troops so they had enough to go through to <coughs> overcome the resistance of the 75th. Um, that's about the best I can say on the subject. Okay. Let me take a drink of water. Yeah, yeah, sure. You guys doing okay? Are you okay? And the boys in the back room? Yeah. Are with us? Yep, just checking. They haven't gone to sleep, I can tell. You can, you, yeah, you keep an eye on them for me. So let me ask you about a couple of, uh, uh, let's talk about some of the people who were, who you, you worked with or who were involved with the unit. Um, and one is uh, 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 Colonel Clifford Simonson. He was a colonel or a lieutenant? Lieutenant colonel. Lieutenant. All the staff officers were lieutenant colonel. Well, first of all, there were a lot of West Point officers in this small unit. Weren't there? Oh yes. Uh, proportion to other units, we were far. I think we had six or seven lieutenant colonel West Pointers. Why do you think you had so many? Well, because we were doing the sounds and sights of a, a arm of a army, you know, the battalion, and all that sort of thing. So you got infantry units, you got artillery units, you got tank units. So you had to have people on the staff who knew how they operated and carried on. You okay on that? Can I, I'm going to ask you, why don't we pause for a moment? We're going to wait for the airplane to go through. Do you hear an airplane? I do. I do. It's probably a helicopter because the... Uh, Is this your ride? Is it come to pick you up, to take you someplace? No, no, I don't. Okay. No. <laughs> Those days are over. I just don't, I like to not have the sounds be on right. the tape, yeah. Well, that gives some uh, Realistic, sonic. Uh, uh, yeah, some sonic. sonic deception going on there. We like to put our own on, though, <laughs> okay. We good? We rolling, Doug? We're rolling. Um, I'm going to ask you that question again. Why so many high-ranking West Point officers in the unit? Well, again, because we were simulating units from battalion up to army. And you get infantry units, you get artillery units, you get tank units, anti-aircraft units. So you had to have people who were experienced in the doctrine of those units and uh, how they operate on the battlefield. Excellent. Uh, excellent thought. So tell me about Lieutenant Colonel Simonson. What, what was his job uh, and how did he do it and what kind of person was he? I have such high regard for Colonel Simons, and he was the S3 of the headquarters. I'm going to ask you that question again, and I, S3 is operations, is that right? So I'd like you to tell it to me that way, because most people in the audience won't know what the S3 is. Colonel Simonson was the S3 of the headquarters. Now, the S3 is responsible for the training and the operations of the unit, and I have the highest regard for Colonel Simons. He was a hardworking, uh, knew his business, dedicated, and uh, because I enjoyed S3 operations, because studying warfare at West Point, I'd hope someday to be an S3, I mean, which could lead to be a commander. And uh, so I spent a lot of time with him, got to know him very well, and would often go out on 
reconnaissance with him and so forth. Uh, after the war, he was just rabid in getting deception sold to the Army. He wanted to do the same things I wanted to do with the an organization established that would dedicate itself to deception. And I would say at least a couple of times a month I'd get a sheaf of paper on uh, deception. As I think I may mention before, he even wrote out a uh, manual, Deception 101. And he had other letters that he'd write to people within the Army. And he'd get comments from uh, people who have been in the 23rd on it. Uh, so I got to know him very, very well. Uh, as I say, highest regard, respect for him. The one thing I remember that he said when we were in Europe, he said, I'm not the smartest guy, but I know my limitations, which I thought was a very astute uh, statement and a recognition of his abilities. I always feel like from the reading I've done that he was an important part of the 23rd success. He was. He was a a driver, a leader, uh, his concepts, his thoughts, and uh, very active in the deception picture. Uh, the commander of the unit was uh, Colonel uh, Harry Reeder. Correct. Uh, tell me about him. Well, he'd been a World War I participant in the war, and uh, being an infantryman, he was looking for combat. He wanted to uh, of course, start out with a regiment, hopefully be a division commander. So he was kind of disgruntled when he got this assignment. But I'll say, uh, I don't think it really bothered you know, what happened, but it was just internally that he was unsatisfied. At least that was my impression. Now, when my company came from the desert to Camp Forest, I remember early on, we were given uh, exercise where we'd ride down the road and given a spot where we would set up our bivouac. Well, we had done this many times in the desert, and my SLP was that in that situation, I, my Jeep driver and first sergeant, and a runner from one of the platoons would be in the first Jeep. In the second Jeep would be the runners from the other three platoons, either the second, third, and headquarters, and then the first with me. So. Once we hit the entrance to the area we're going to be in, I would drive in and, if possible, drive through the area and figure out this is where the first platoon's going, the second, the third, the headquarters, and that sort of thing. And each of the runners, I would indicate where the area was so that when the column came up and started leaving the road, if it was the first, which was normally the first platoon was first, the runner would get with the lieutenant, lead the platoon to its area, the second one would do it, and the third one would get it. They start out the hole, they start digging their slit train or their box holes and uh, mess would get set up. And he was there watching, so he was extremely impressed. I never had a word from him again. Because we had impressed of course after he saw S the six oh third and the signal going through something like that, well made quite an impression. Well you guys, I mean not to knock the guys in the 603rd. I know many of those guys and, and like them a lot, but you guys were the real soldiers. That so. is correct. Oh, sorry. It's slipping down? Yeah. I'll just put it outside here. And if you want to just lift your arm over that wire, there we go. Do you want me to continue on that? Yeah, I, uh, once he's rolling again. So I was going to say, you guys were the real soldiers. Well, again, reading you know stories about warfare, engineers have to be prepared to step into the line as infantry. And I really believe that, and I train my people that way. In fact, <laughs> uh, when I took over the company, I told them one of the first things. I said, you know, my mission is to bring you back to life. And so the, the training you're going to get is going to be hard and it may be difficult. You just bear with me. So when we were out in the desert on the weekends, the other units all go into war and so forth, but not every weekend, but on several, I kept them out. And we ran exercises 
pretend we were infantry. I remember one was we set up the unit in bivouac, and then the first sergeant and I and another one got blank ammunition, and we attacked it. And I'd already told the U.S. the, the lieutenants what to do. So at one time, then they all started getting out, you know, evacuating the site. And uh, this was a good experience because oftentimes the trucks would go front into their position, then they'd have to back out and do it. But I told them that you go in backwards so that you're ready really to move out. And so some of them, you know, were slow in doing that. And the other thing, only one case I know that anybody left any equipment behind was a rifle. So again, that was a lesson to impress upon. No, I, I thought they should be infantry. The thing I wanted to do, not only to install the discipline, but to develop trust with the people. When you go out on guard, you're guarding your people. And I don't want anybody going to sleep and so forth. So as a result of these exercises, seriously, when we got into uh, situations in Europe where we had to post the guard, I never worried about them because I knew they would perform as they should be. So they were a real battle heart. Let me tell you another one was, at Camp Force, the 7th Airborne Division came in. And we were given a road test on that one, column going road, anti-aircraft. And we placed either second or third in comparison to all the uh, units of the 70th uh, Airborne Division. So they were really, a, a, as I say, a very well, I felt, a well-trained, disciplined outfit. Just let me carry that forward a bit. On VJ Day, we were up at uh, Watertown, Camp Drum. And they had the V-Day, VJ Day parade. And my unit marched in it. And uh, fortunately for me, a photographer in a newspaper was up on the first floor taking a picture looking down on the unit. They used to always call this the West Point Company anyways, but there was no West Point unit I've ever seen that was as good as this one. Because every man was in line and in column and you look at the rifles and what they're bearing, you know, they're all in line, marching out. So I was real proud. So that's, again, a, a manifestation of what a great outfit it was. Uh, wh why'd they call you the West Point Company? Because I was from West Point and I treated my cadets, you know, the discipline uh, on training exercises. If we were going from Station A to Station B, once, it, well, we marched for a while, practice. but most of the time we double timed because I wanted to get them into physical condition. So, uh, so Colonel Reeder, uh, um, um, you know, I'll tell you, it's probably not a secret to you, there's, there's a number of the people we talked to were, were not, uh, didn't have positive things to say about him. Uh, I, I'd say primarily enlisted men and junior officers. I'm mm -hmm. talking about, I haven't, you're the most senior officer I've, I've spoken to uh, in, in the unit. Um, there aren't a lot of others around to speak to. Um, uh, is that fair or, or unfair, that kind of criticism? Of yeah, I can see where some the lower ranks would think, because he spent more time overseeing them. As I say, he didn't uh, come to my unit very often. Another person I wanted to talk to you about, was, who I know you know very well, was Billy Harris, Colonel Harris. Tell me about him and you know, starting the war, and I know you have a post-war relationship with him <coughs> as well. Okay, my first contact with Billy Harris was on the beaches of Normandy. Uh, I had my unit in bivouac and so forth, and he came by to inspect it. He was a full colonel at the time, and he took me around. He was nitpicking, <laughs> and so when he got through, I said, Sir, if you don't like the way I'm running this company, get me relieved. <laughs> now, I hearken back to this because later on, 1963, uh, I was commanding the 521st Engineer Combat Group, or group, not combat, 521st Group in Europe. And we were the maintenance and supply group of the engineers. And we were responsible for the maintenance and supply of all engineer equipment in the Army area. Well, I'd had that uh, group for a a year, and I was scheduled to go on to 7th Army Headquarters as the plans officer, which I really would have liked, because three, as I was, G3, because I'd been in the G3 and 8th Army as the plans officer. So I just loved plans. 
Um, so one day he comes along he, with his helicopter, drops into my eye, he said, George, I want you to come ride with me. So we flew over to the 555th Engineer Company, which was at Swessing, which wasn't too far away. We dropped down, and the commander came out and reported. And so uh, Harris says, uh, I forget the, his name. He says, I'd like to use your conference room for a few minutes, if I may. So we marched, walked into that. He says, George, I don't want you to go to 7th Army. He said, you waste your talents up there. He said, I want you to be my chief of staff because one was rotating out. So I thought about it, and I said, chief of staff sounds pretty good in your resume. So I became his chief of staff. And uh, I remember when he took over the headquarters when I was the engineer group commander, I remember one statement he said, he said, I never worry about my efficiency report if I take care of my man. I, to me, he was the best commanding general of troops and so forth I served under because he really did take care of his people uh, several times. Well, uh, uh, his practice that when any soldier died and the widow was departing to go to Europe, they usually went out of Frankfurt, he would be at that airport to say goodbye to them. And I remember one instance where a little child said, Sir, can I have one of your stars? So he picked it. In fact, he took both of them off and gave it to the thing. And I also know that after he retired, because I was at his retirement at uh, San Antonio, I was at that time then the uh, district engineer of the Tulsa district in Tulsa. So I used to go down there to see him before he retired. But I know that after he retired, he was sending out letters to widows. He kept in good touch with them. He really took care of those ladies. So I respect him very much. The other thing was discipline. I can remember a couple, there's at least two, were one of the soldiers of a, we had about eight groups and about seven battalions, about a total of 16, 18 major units under us. And so we covered the whole area of Seventh Army. So if a soldier was picked up for being not clean and that's all, and the word got back to Harris, he would have the squad leader, the platoon leader, the platoon officer, the company commander, right up to the battalion and the group. And they'd come in the office and they'd line up and he would talk to them and this sort of thing. So he re really knew how to command them. In fact, Billy Harris, during the Korean War, commanded the 7th Cavalry, you know, <laughs> the old uh, one that was Trying to think of who commanded. Custom. Co yeah. And uh, when they broke out of Poussin, he led the breakout, and his unit, 7th Cav, marked, some, marked something like 80 miles against a determined enemy. And that was the longest march of any Army unit ever in the history of the Army against a determined enemy. So he was quite, quite a fellow. I had great respect for him. Just loved working with him as his chief of staff. Now one of the things that, uh, as, as you know, uh, I'm interested in sort of who thought the idea of the Ghost Army up, and, and, and there's a few people who are working on uh, uh, General Dever's staff uh, in the special plans, and, and uh, Colonel Harris is the commander of it at that time. Uh, uh, Ralph Ingersoll is involved there as well, and Ralph Ingersoll has claimed some credit for this, although some people think that uh, credit claim is, is bullshit. Um, others think it might be, it might not be. I wonder if you have, I don't know if you ever talked to Harris about this or if you have any of your opinions formed then the basis of your own observations. No, I do not, except I know he was active cause in the plans because during our operations he would often come down to observe what's going on and also he would be the one to go to the corps and the armies to recommend a <coughs> situation for the use of the unit. Right, that's something I think people don't understand also. Who, who, who and I'll just ask it as a separate question, if you need to, you can spit it to me. What I have is a problem here, vocal cords. There are four nerves that go down there, and one of them doesn't operate. Mm -hmm. So saliva pools there. Oh. So either I have to wash it down or cough it up. 
It's got to go one way or the other. <coughs> Me, mo, 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 I'm ready to go. Awesome. Who decided what deceptions the ghost army was going to do? Well, that's a little different question. All I know is that Dever's the one who initiated the thing, and um, Bradley got into it, and their concept was to develop this deception unit for the crossing of the Rhine River, because they knew that was going a major obstacle and would be a major fight. In fact, uh, estimates were at the time we were on the Rhine that you know as high as 12,000 people could be uh, casualties actually happened, only 31 were in it. So that, to me, marked a great success of it. But that was the purpose of the, of the unit. And I think, you know, having the two infantry and armored divisions uh, to utilize them as they best they can. So that's the only uh, thinking that I can think of advance of the formation of the unit because from then on, there was, actually, we learned by trial and error. Right, but the, the in other words, it, it w wasn't it the um, the special plans branch and, and Harris who were involved in saying, well, you're going to do, you're going this operation is going to take place, or this particular operation is going to take place. Was that was that the level it was decided on? Well, I think it was in conjunction with the core, the Army Division uh, commanders, whether they wanted to do it or not. As I say, some of them were very enthusiastic, others were not. Okay. Uh, it does seem like you ended up with a, a lot of deceptions that ended up being in, uh, in uh, the, the Third Army area. That's something that, uh, that uh, Roy and I have talked about, that you, you did a number of uh, deceptions that were under uh, 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 you know, Patton's area of uh, control. I don't think that's a true statement, yes as I reflect back on the areas and so forth. <clears throat> um, so uh, let me ask you about a couple of your officers in the, uh, in the 406th, uh, 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 Lieutenants Aliopolis and, and Daly. Uh, just if you can tell me a little bit about each of them and, and what they did and what they were like. Yeah, uh, of the uh, three platoon leaders, I would put Aliopolis by far the best. He was a, a Greek descent and very conscientious. And I think he was a little older than the others, too. And you could give him a mission and you didn't have to worry about it because he would carry it out. In fact, if I had an opportunity to promote him to a company commander or have him promoted, I would be. In fact, I think toward the end of the operation, I know he was taken away from me and put in a 603rd, and I think that was probably what they had in mind, but of course, uh, we were deactivated before that could take place. But uh, Aliopoulos was an excellent soldier, uh, best one, and his men just loved him. Uh, How about Lieutenant Daly? I don't, what's his first name? I'm George. Sorry. And he's, he's still alive, yes? Yes. I think he's got Alzheimer's now, I think. Um, George uh, was a very intelligent officer, uh, a little bit immature at that time, and uh, needed a little extra training. I can remember when we were in Camp Forest that uh, we had to run the platoons through attacking a village and so forth. So the first time, uh, he was not passed. Mm. So I took him in hand and we practiced and practiced and educate him, train him, and this sort of thing. So he passed the second time. But George was a, a, a good commander. He had the first platoon, which was the MP platoon on all the operations, and they did an excellent job. Can we pause for a moment? Sure. Um, Roy, do you want to sit in and ask a few questions? Um, do you have anything that you wanted to, to discuss? I have a couple more, but I thought I yeah. would. Um, here, I'll, I'll, I'll give you 10 minutes or so. <coughs> Step out. And you'll, you'll hear the creaking. What's the water? <laughs> Whenever he says to go, you can give your thing. I'll start. 
Did you settle there? Yeah, because I got fine. Okay, fine. Fine, cut. Roll. Um, the official history says that the 23rd Special Troops was actually the first American unit in the St. Lo. Um, that's the official history. What's, what's your take on that? Well, when we came ashore in Normandy, uh, we had that first operation, which was to assimilate uh, one of the armored divisions. Now, I, I can't understand why they'd be the first ones in there because the real troops were the ones that went into St. Lo. Uh, so I can't visualize that any of the too many of the uh, 23rd headquarters was in the Lo St. Early, I can remember passing through St. Lo when we started out on the missions toward Brest and the like. Yeah, it, <clears throat> the official history said that you went in and when you discovered that you'd gotten ahead of the people you were supposed to be ahead of, you got out. So I have no knowledge of that. Okay. Um, just to follow up, uh, when you were, were impersonating um, regimental commanders, about how old were you? Some was around 24, 25 in there. Probably 24 going on 25. And what was the average age of a colonel at that point? <laughs> Reed was, uh, Reeder was uh, an elderly gentleman by that time. I'm sure he must have been at least in his 40s. But as far as the youngest side, I, I don't think any of them were you know, in that range because <clears throat> they'd probably, well, well, let's see now. Janerone, who, no, I, I have no idea when, because he was taken out and put in the 6th Army. They went to the Pacific, and that's where he became a full colonel. And I remember corresponding with him during the war. We kept close contact. Uh, but uh, generally, they, they weren't that early. I imagine the airborne unit is where you found some uh, young full colonels. Going back to uh, the end of Operation Koblenz and the German attack in the Bulge, uh, the 16th of December, uh, is it that, that point that you ended up uh, getting injured in the jeep accident? Yes. No, that was on about, I think, the 15th or 14th of December. Oh, okay. What, what's your recollection of the, the whole period of the, the attack in the bulge? Well, we went back to Luxembourg, and then uh, the signal company only performed an operation as the 4th, Infantry, or maybe the 4th Armored and the 80th Infantry were moving up that area. They halted outside of uh, Luxembourg City, the north of it, and our signal people positioned them uh, a bit east and south of Luxembourg to portray to the uh, Germans that this is where they were located, where it's actually their closer to uh, Bastogne, so when they attacked, uh, they were much closer than the Germans would have thought them to be. So you were actually operating a, a, a electronic deception um, while you had, while the units were moving in toward Bastogne? Yes, because they moved through Luxembourg and had stopped in this position, and uh, our people, portray him as being, having stopped some other place further away from Bastogne. Um, there are a number of pictures, this is kind of a, a slightly offbeat question, there are a number of pictures of Marlena Dietrich um, in Eagle Tack and forward in the general area that where the 23rd Special Troops were. Uh, we've got pictures of men from the 23rd uh, with her. Do you know, did you run into her? Do you know why she was even there? Well, yeah, she put on a performance, sort of a USO performance. Yeah, which we watched her perform and so forth, right. 
Um, what what did what did the twenty third special troops do, and, and specifically uh, your company uh, immediately at the end of, of World War II? Well, uh, immediately at the German surrender. Uh, from there on, before you came back, what what were some of the things you did? Well, twenty uh, third was given the mission of um, handling the DPs, the Russians, the Poles, and the others that <coughs> were in Europe, in Germany, I mean, I'm sorry. Um, well, if you want, I'll go through what we did. Yeah, we've, we've got a plane going by. We'll Boy, you guys got better ears than I do. <laughs> they have better ears than I do, but I can still hear the plane, so I'm, it's probably picking yeah, up. Yeah, it's the helicopters, they are frequently over for me. Um, okay, could, uh, could you explain what are what DPs are and, and how you got them and, and what you what you did with them? Well, they were displaced persons. That's what DP stood for. And after the war, they were being gathered together to be shipped back to their uh, countries. The one I remember very well is we had control of uh, bomb holder and. Uh, they were in the, the barracks of the German army that were there, and that's where they were housed. And there was something like 17,000 Germans, 2,000 Poles, and a mixture of the other Eastern European countries. So I had, I, there were five officers, 161 enlisted men. And so I had one, my object was for me to do nothing but just oversee what was going on. So daily, I know, had the mission of going out in the country and collecting food for them from the Germans. Another one I had uh, security around the uh, area so that they weren't moving freely out into the country. Like I knew they would attack the Germans and take whatever they wanted, the DPs. And then I had uh, another one which were in charge of disciplinary matters. We had a court, and if they did something wrong, they'd be brought before them. <coughs> so I had a meeting with the leader of the Russians and the Poles the first night, because they were the two major uh, factions. And uh, all the Poles just weren't about to let the Russians be in charge of, but from my standpoint, they had the majority number so, of people. So I said, you know, we're gonna stay here all night if necessary till we solve this matter. So it ended up that the Russian, it was a major, was uh, put in charge of the people. And I assured the Poles, I said, if any time you think they're being unfair to you, you come directly to me. Now, uh, deal with them. So it worked out pretty well. The one thing I can't remember, I go see the Russian commander major about once a week and it was, uh, the ritual was the uh, table there and uh, on it would be uh, cherries and pieces of bread and so forth. And then they would bring in the vodka. And they served the water sized uh, drinks and so I had to go in <laughs> up with them, and I'll tell you, after I got through with that meeting, I told my jeep, I said, we're going no place, we're going out in the woods and let me rest. <laughs> um, no, that, that was a fine experience uh, with them. We taught them how to use uh, the latrines, uh, built the wood latrines and so forth, and we found that some of them started out stand, standing and squatting on them and trying to hit the hole and so forth. No, that, oh, one other thing. When we moved into Baumholder, uh, I had to find billets for my people. I had done this before, so I got a hold of the mayor and I said, you know, where can we house my people? And he said, well, over here, over here, in the gym and that sort of thing. So then I said, well, what about these houses here? You know, people. He said, well, they're occupied. Okay, if those occupancies are good for my people, they're good enough for your people, so you move out. So we did, we took over the housing. And I set up a curfew, and I can remember the first night, 
about a half hour afterwards, a young lady, I'd say, a 22 or so, just in her plain clothes, was put in curfew. Well, I was living in a cafe, so I opened up the, the, the stairway into the basement and so forth. And so that's where she spent the night. She got cold, but I never had anybody be, break curfew in the future. Um, Billy Harris uh, did some presentations at the Command and General Staff College after the war on perception. Uh, were you there for any of those? Never was, no. No, it's a shame. Uh, he wasn't around when Don wrote his book and that sort of thing because he could have had a lot of important uh, details. <clears throat> um, there was a, a survey right after the German surrender of uh, about 40 general officers and asking for their assessment of deception operations. Uh, are you familiar with that? No, I'm not. Did you ever um, get a sense from talking to anybody later about kind of what they they thought about no. the deception operations during no. World War II? Regret I didn't, so I had no opportunity. Um, what have we not asked you that? Oh, I got a couple more. Okay, I'll, great. I'll slip back in. You guys can put it on pause. Tell me again, we talked about this earlier. You, you, you guys are operating, uh, first of all, tell me what kind of equipment your unit had. Tell me about your equipment. Okay, if you take a regular engineer company, it has water-cooled machine guns. I mean, uh, light machine guns, they're not water. So in our TE, we had water-cooled machine guns because you can fire longer and uh, the belts are bigger and so forth. And the other change, another change was every truck had a 60 caliber anti-aircraft or a 60 caliber machine gun used for anti-aircraft purposes. Uh, another one was we had water, water point equipment, so we could set up a water point so that the 23rd headquarters had a source of potable water. The next big one was in the engineer company, well, normal companies don't have the portable water. I mean, that's to, uh, furnished by division. Uh, another one was that in an engineer company, there's one bulldozer. But each of my platoons had one, so I gave us three bulldozers so we could lay out more uh, track marks on the terrain. Well, I want to ask about that. And again, I'm, I'm, I kind of know the answer that I'm asking the question about, but I don't think people would quite figure out how bulldozers help you do a deception. Can you explain that? Well, one of the main ways is by scurrying up the ground for tanks. You do that and then you put the dummy tank on top and cover with a camouflage. So from the air, it looks like you've got a real tank there on the ground. Uh, the other one is that in the case of tanks and also artillery pieces at times, depending upon the terrain and where the enemy is, we had to cut out uh, excavated areas, holes, to emplace those tanks and uh, artillery pieces so they would be better protected from artillery or fire into them. So that was probably the, well, other thing at times was we had a clear paths through forests, you know, light timber, so that bulldozers would clear those away. Or any time moving rubble or things like that, the bulldozers were handy. But the, uh, I'm going to ask about it again, and I apologize for asking the same question over and over. That's all right. Just trying to kind of get it in the best way I can use it. Uh, assume that I know nothing, which is really easy, right? But assume that I know nothing about deception. Um, um, you're using these inflatable tanks. I don't understand why you need to put tank tracks in with the bulldozer. What's that all For somebody who doesn't understand anything about that, what's that all about? Well, in the case of a real tank moving in... You're going to have to hold the answer now until the, until the clock finishes ticking and going. Sorry about that. If you want to have a drink of water or something, 
Yeah, you yeah, always drink water. Yeah. Anything yeah. else you want to put in? 50 cal, not 60. Okay, I'm, I'm not concerned about it. I okay, so we were talking about, uh, again, for somebody who doesn't understand, why do you need bulldozers to make these, these, these tank tracks for the part of the deception? In a natural situation, when a tank moves into an area, especially if it's an open area, it's going to show its tracks, marks on the ground where the tank actually went. And in the case, what we were doing was trying to replicate that by the use of the bulldozer tracks. So they would circle the area, move into a position that a real tank would take, and then put the inflated dummy tank on top of it, cover it with the camouflage, so that for aerial observation, this is the primary reason you're doing it, would uh, show in its uh, photograph the tank, the camouflage, and then the tracks leading up to the tank so that you knew that this was a, a real tank down there. We would indicate to the enemy that that was the case. It's amazing how much detail has to go into deception. That, that is one of the reasons why you need well-trained, disciplined people because uh, you want to do it exactly because if the enemy or the local natives who are unfriendly to us pick up these irregularities, these things that aren't quite right, well, that starts tipping the enemy off that this could be deception rather than a real unit. So discipline of the people, this comes in wearing the shoulder patches, the bumper markings to be sure that everybody does. You have to stop. Sorry, in your answer. Right. Well, we were just saying how much, um, how much, you were telling us how much detail and discipline you need for deception. That is correct. And why it was important was that there are agents going around on the ground, and also for aerial photography, whatever they see or hear, they're going to ask the question, is this real or not? And uh, you, you don't want to have irregularities or mistakes in what you're doing because this would alert the enemy to something that may be deception, not the real thing. And would you say that you guys uh, learned more about deception as you went along? That is correct. Tell me about that. Well, back in uh, Camp Forest, really there was not much attention paid to special effects. And then when we got on the continent, we found that we had to do the shoulder patches, the bumper markings, the CP signs and all that, which we really hadn't thought about back there. And then also, most importantly was that each of the soldiers, when we went into an area and uh, simulated a division, that the soldiers knew who the commanding general was and if they were regiment, the regimental commander and some of the history of the unit so that when they got uh, questioned by somebody, well, they could answer. Because it's not infrequent that, say, we're assimilating the 80th Division, that a soldier from the 80th Division comes through the area. Now, he may be coming from a hospital on his way back to his unit and sees the 80th people, so he starts you know, asking, where's so-and-so, and that sort of thing. Um. You touched on with Roy, but I wanted to ask you to explain it again. A, a deception that takes place um, uh, really during the Battle of the Bulge, a radio-only deception. Uh, can you tell me about that? What, what was the point of that? Well, as you recall, General Patton's divisions were opposite Sar, which is quite a distance from Bastogne, and he had made this march up to attack at Bastogne to relieve the uh, encirclement. Well, the 4th Armored and the 80th Division, as I recall, there were two divisions anyway, that had stopped north of Luxembourg. And what they wanted to do was to make it appear that those two divisions had not gotten that far. So they would be, Germans wouldn't think that they're that imminent in attacking. So they portrayed those two divisions, I think it was somewhere southeast of Luxembourg anyways, uh, for radio communications. It was only in operation, I think, 24, 36 hours, because the real divisions then took off in the attack on Bastogne. 
So this was this was was something to help Patton's drive to Bastogne. Well, what it was was to make the Germans think that they were not that far up yet, that close to Bastogne, that they were regrouping, ready for the attack. So th this would give the Germans the impression that the divisions were further away and not as close to Bastogne and ready for the attack. This must have been put together at the last minute. It was. Um, any memories of that? Or were you involved no, in that? No, no, I would say that was purely signal. Purely the signal people. Um, the, um, I guess the, the, the question that, that's sort of important uh, to ask is um, what you think it's important for people to remember about this story. I mean, this is something that happened 60... Seven years ago, 66, 67 years ago. Why is this an important story for us to remember today? Well, I think at one level, it's uh, Dever's part and so others thinking out of the box because we had never had a unit dedicated to deception before in our Army experience. A unit that would go from one uh, operations or another, sort of a traveling road show is what it was, and the players were players uh, playing their part. So I think that's one part. Uh, to me is that it takes, that the deception helped reduce the number of casualties in the war. It's not the number of Germans that were killed, but how many American soldiers were saved because of it, were, what, were not casualties. Um, I think those are the main things, but then again, as I have said, it's important to build upon what was learned during World War II as far as deception and uh, develop the equipment, the thinking, and the manuals and so forth in the event we have to use on a large scale in the future. Now, the reason that uh, the 23rd headquarters was kept secret until 1996 was that there was thought if the Russians ever attacked, we'd have to uh, establish another one of these kinds of units and so forth. So that was the reason for that delay. Um, before I, 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 I can I ask one more thing, but actually seriously, do you guys, as you've been listening in, is there any, anything you're curious about? Anything you, you want to know about that you? Yeah, I was eager because they uh, had improvised a lot of special effects The, the um, um, Brian wants to know, um, in improvising the special effects, was there anything that you thought was particularly innovative, unusual, that you did in, in, um, in improvising those special effects? Well, no, I, I think if you're going to do the special effects, it's normal that you do the uh, shoulder patches, the bumper markings, and the uh, uh, CP signs, that sort of thing. That's what a real division would show to you. But I think the real thing to me that was innovative in the sense that each of the soldiers in that situation for that regiment or division knew the commanding officers, uh, the history of the unit, what they had done. I, I thought that was rather innovative and extremely important because people were questioned uh, either by civilians or by other soldiers or by members of that unit that uh, were passing by. I thought it was interesting that you guys created phony command posts. What, what goes into creating a phony command post? Well, uh, depending upon where you are, it's uh, putting up a tent for the commander, uh, having the enlisted people present that would be in a normal command post, and depending upon the level, an MP uh, guarding the command post. Um, and picking the site of one that would simulate what an actual commander would uh, select for his command post. Um, uh, I, this isn't particularly for the film, but I did want to ask, I've been reading the, the history uh, of the 406 that was written. Do you know what, who the soldier was who wrote that? Do you recall? Uh, I 
Yeah, it's a four or five little. I, I just can't recall it, but no. What, what happened on that was uh, when we I found out what our mission was going to be. I said it'd be worthwhile to have a history of what we were doing. So I talked to several enlisted men. This one stepped forward. And said, he had experience in writing. Said he'd do it. So he was in charge. I had forgotten all about it to the end of the war. He came up and he presented it to me. Now, in my reading of it, to me, it's extremely well detailed, well written, and very knowledgeable as to what went on. One thing I figured must have happened, because take Brest, there were three task forces that moved out there, but each one of them was in detail. I know he couldn't have been on all three of them, so he, he must have had a, a group around him who provided information on it. Yeah, there's a lot of information there that I was not aware of. It's a terrific document. Yeah, I, I'm going to finish it up and try to incorporate photographs and that sort of thing. Not print it published publicly, but give it to the Engineer History Division. The, yeah, it is a d division. I'm just going to look and see if there's anything else I want to ask about, but I think I'm pretty much at the end. Um, Roy, anything else from your point of view? Um, what What was your unit doing while you were in England before you went over? What we were doing in England was, one, we were helping the 603rd test its inflatable equipment to see that it was operational. I'm going to ask you to start again, and, and then the mic fell off, and also you shouldn't look at uh, Roy. You have to pretend Roy's not in England before you went over to uh, Europe. To, Europe. Yeah, one of the things was uh, to help the 603rd test this inflatable equipment because they'd received it there in England, and so what they would do is uh, inflate it, and then our people would move it around to uh, positions and let it stand there for a while, and then if uh, it had a leak in it, to do the repair and so forth. So that was one of the main ones. Another one, there were some exercises that were run, which uh, our platoons took part in. Uh, well, the other ones, I kept them in training. I mean, I, physically, we ran exercises, as I did infantry exercises, attacking at night in woods and that sort of thing, keeping them in shape. Uh, you were saying that you that that. Uh, Colonel Harris would come by from time to time to inspect uh, stuff that you were doing. Did you ever see uh, uh, Ingersoll, Major Ingersoll? Never saw him, no. Okay. I, his name was familiar to me because uh, he, he was, I think, an uh, editor for somebody. He wrote a book, didn't he? I... He wrote a book during the war about the fighting in Italy. I see. And he had been editor of uh, P, uh, publisher of PM and right. been involved with Fortune. Uh, magazine. He's mentioned your 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 writer of your history um, mentions it that he has showed up at, at here and there at some point. But uh, so he's around. Um, people either seem to like him or really hate him. So uh, I had no personal yeah. contact. You know. Um, and um, I, I the only other question I would ask is because you were just talking about the inflatable tanks and uh, did it. Uh, um, any unusual uh, stories or happenings uh, in terms of dealing with, uh, in, in, you know, 93-pound inflatable tanks instead of dealing with the real thing? I, I have no experience. Fair the only not. thing I remember back, just talking about uh, the, the equipment, back in the, st in the States at Camp Forest, uh, my company would put on, you know, 12 hours. I'd change the people where they made dummy tanks with wood, you know, and covered it with canvas and that sort of thing. For, for practice? For practicing purposes. So you guys worked pretty closely with the, with the men in the 603rd? Correct. Less closely with the sonic units? The own, sonic unit had their own security thing, uh, capability. We may have provided security in terms of a larger operation, but it really didn't have any contact. I knew the officers and acquaintances. 
Okay, well, I think I'm all set. I think I've asked everything I want to ask about, and uh, I really appreciate your time. Oh, I enjoyed it. I, I do have oh. one question. Oh. No, sure. it's, it doesn't have to be on camera. No, they should all be on camera, okay. unless, you, unless you don't want it to be. Oh, no. Um, there have been a couple of different um, explanations about the inflatables. Uh, did you see inflatables at Camp Forest? I did not. No, I did not. Because some people have said that they, that's where they first saw them, but I've, there's nothing in the record that says some people they say that they first saw them in England. Yeah, yeah. and that, that seems to be more the case. All right. Well.